It is a great honor to welcome Professor Holly Lawford Smith to this podcast. She is a political philosopher who is currently teaching at the University of Melbourne, and she recently published a book titled "Sex Matters: Essays in Gender Critical Philosophy." How are you today, Holly? Thank you for joining us. I'm good. It's nice to be talking to you. Um, so uh, I should like to first uh, mention that, yeah, you're also a painter too. So uh, tell us about that. <laughs> That's, um, it makes me sound more creative than I am. It's just um, house painting. I'm painting some walls and door frames at the moment. The boring kind of painting. Yeah, um, yeah you have an Instagram page where you do arts and crafts and such, right? Oh, that's true. I started this project when I was on sabbatical in Edinburgh of trying to catch tiny bits of peeling paint in cities that close up look like abstract artworks. Uh, but that was a few years ago now. I don't think I've posted anything to that page for about, oh, I don't know, a couple of years. I did take a photo the other day, but then I'm so out of the habit that I forgot to even post it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was really obsessed with that for a while. Though I would go every lunchtime looking for little bits of great stuff around the city i see okay now so, um let's get into uh, our topic of the hour uh your collection of essays um so in reference to the your previous book which is titled gender critical feminism uh yeah i would like to i'd like to ask you to explain that uh, identification what does it mean to be a gender critical feminist to me, it has a pretty simple definition. It's just to be a feminist who thinks that feminism is about the class of female people. So it's a sort of reorientation of feminism back to um, the thing that we have in common, the thing that our sort of um, subordination or historical oppression is plausibly tied to. And it's a kind of what response to mainstream feminisms having moved away from that. So it's sort of putting the putting the sex back into uh, sex class or caste or back into feminism, um, which might sound pretty banal to people that haven't encountered these debates, like, wow, feminism has something to do with females. But I think that you need some other background of like where, where mainstream and academic feminism has gone to understand why that move is, uh, is necessary. But I, yeah, I think it really is necessary. So that was part of the project of the gender critical feminism book and in that book I guess I was trying to do more than just the kind of conflict between gender critical feminists and trans activists I wanted to sort of make the big picture of what gender critical feminism as the descendant of radical feminism as I see it is about and then in this newest book I sort of gave myself permission to dig in a bit more on the the conflict between gender critical feminism and radical feminism and trans activism. So this book is much more about those issues. I see. So um, tell me how uh, you inserted yourself into the this um, debate regarding trans activism, trans rights, and just transgender in general. You mean like the the catalyst for getting involved, or do you mean yeah, how how did you become involved? Um, for me, it was a kind of a personal thing or a sort of solidarity thing. Um, the moments that I really remember, there's two of them. One is going to a lecture by Professor Cordelia Fine and watching her. There was a trans activist in the audience of her talk. That was at the University of Melbourne. And watching this trans activist really kick off about the fact that she'd been talking about the sexes. So she'd been talking about male and female development and I think it was in relation to her new book at the time which was testosterone rex so she was talking about the effects of testosterone on the male sex and this activist was just like really kind of yeah making a big fuss about the fact that she'd called these two different kinds of human male and female he almost seemed to want to like her to have called them like system one and system two or like type a and type b or something like that so that was, that was my first like red flag thinking something strange is going on here. What is it? And kind of empathizing with her a sort of woman trying to do normal feminism or normal academic work and then kind of getting harangued by these activists. And then what I see as a much more significant moment came later. And that was Kathleen Stock in the UK 
um, writing this essay about the Gender Recognition Act reform and sort of asking where the feminist philosophers were at, like what's going on is a really important social issue. Philosophers trained in like ethics, political philosophy, feminist philosophy, and so on could be making a contribution. Where were they? Why were they also quiet? And then she just got like absolutely piled on both inside and outside of the discipline. And so again, for me, it was this personal thing of like, well, I, I think what she's saying is reasonable. I think she has the right to say it. I absolutely hate how she's being treated. So somehow I think I had that impulse to like join her in saying it, which at least helps to like share the targets of the vitriol. <laughs> like it makes it a little like lighter because it's, there's more of us. And I think some people in the UK felt the same way. So there was maybe six of us women at the time, women philosophers who kind of came together and started doing a bit of stuff in that area. But maybe I've been the one to like take it up most enthusiastically aside from Kathleen. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you've encountered quite vigorous opposition in your current academic institution for your stances. I mean, I've read a couple of articles on Quillette about how, you know, students who may or may not be in your classes start calling you nasty names and, I wonder, um, well, first, I'm very sorry that that happened. And secondly, um, Thanks. has that, um, um, has that, uh, I guess, how has that uh, played into how you, um, your worldview, like, as in, like, your views regarding this issue? Yeah, um, I guess it's interesting because most of the opposition, it's been so clearly demarcated as being sort of from activists student activists on campus, but that are in a sort of very different ideological space or in a very different sort of disciplinary context. So I haven't ever really felt it as a threat to my own um, worldview might be the wrong word, but I guess what I'm trying to say is it's never made me feel uncertain about my position. Like I've always kind of... Um, I've thought it's inappropriate or I've thought it's like really uninformed, um, but I've never really seen a real challenge. And maybe that's because often the opposition can't even articulate my view. So, you know, if there were like students saying what my actual view was and showing that they'd like done the homework, but having good objections, I do think intellectually I would take those objections seriously because I feel like I do have some responsibility to my, my the university community um, but a lot of it is just like the sorts of things they say, they just reveal so much ignorance about, it's just a caricature of the gender critical feminist position, or they just accuse you of really ludicrous things that you, you obviously don't think. So I, I sort of see it that they're doing pure politics. Um, and if they can convince some people that the things they make up are true, that's helpful to their cause, but it doesn't really have much to do with me. I'm just, it's just sort of using my name. And so far, luckily, I've never really had opposition in a sort of vitriolic way from my own students. And that means from philosophy students or from students in my own classes. Um, anytime there has been disagreement, but it's almost exclusively been respectful disagreement. And maybe a couple of times a student has sort of found out about the controversy and kind of got in cold feet and withdrawn. But I've almost never had someone just like, yeah, staying through the semester and then like, making these um behaving like the activists but kind of right up in my space so yeah I don't yeah I don't know so far it's been I don't know what to make of all that it's just that somehow um somehow it's okay so far I can just do my job and get on with my teaching and my relations with my students and that activism kind of just plays out over there in the corner I see um I I noticed that having um uh... Had um, Kathleen as well as um, Megan Murphy on this podcast, I I see that a lot of um, vitriol that the um, trans activist class uh, directed towards uh, it is is less likely to be men or at least men on the right, but more yeah. women who are feminists who are gender critical like yourself. So that is a you know gender double standard that uh, unfortunately disadvantages women um you see that um yeah you, know, you see that people like um i don't know tucker carlson who basically yeah. says the same thing regarding trans people as a um jk rowling but 
Tucker does not get the even half the amount of attacks that Rowling has got. So uh, I wonder if um, whether your gender or your sex plays into this role, or is it just your politics? That's really interesting. Um, partly because I don't think I have the right control. So that I've got two hypotheses, right? One is that it's it's as you say, it's sort of sexist, or there's like a sex-based double standard going on. Women, there's all these stereotypes. Women are supposed to be, yeah, like caring for the vulnerable and protecting the marginalized and nurturing and caring and all those stereotypes feed into like if you're told that a minority group is vulnerable or has a high suicide rate or really will feel distressed if you treat them in a certain way women much more than men are supposed to be receptive to that so gender critical feminists are violating gender norms by being trans women exclusionary so I definitely think that's one hypothesis but the other hypothesis is it's not a threat to people on the left that people on the right disagree with them. Indeed, they thrive on that. It's a threat to people on the left when people on the left disagree with them. Mm. Indeed, that is intolerable to them because they want to maintain a party line of leftism. That And at the moment, the obsession is around this kind of identity politics, deference through these intersectional hierarchies and so on. So, of course, in that respect, someone like me or someone like Kathleen um, at least at the time, I'm not sure, sure if she's shifted a bit, but we are a much greater threat than someone like Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson's comfortable. He, he's, he's, he's in the enemy position that he's supposed to be in over there. He'd be threatening if he's a Democrat. So I think the test will be if a left-wing man really comes out as gender critical and then we watch how he's treated. And maybe there's a bit of that in the UK, like you can compare Graham Linehan's treatment against mm -hmm. someone like J.K. Rowling's but then Graham Linehan gets an awful lot of pile on. So maybe it's a leftist thing more than a sexism thing or yeah. Or maybe the way we get piled on is kind of equally big, but there's a bit more like rape jokes and violence jokes to the women and a bit more like your marriage got ruined jokes towards Graham, like more personal stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm just sort of open between those two hypotheses at the moment because most of the men that are gender critical that I know tend to be more conservative. I think um this uh level of temperature uh that well that the um gender transgender activists uh, contribute to it obscures the fact that there is significant disagreement between uh, uh, the position that you hold and those who believe that well we should extend uh, certain rights to uh, transgender people because they are um currently a societally marginalized group, despite the fact that there are a bunch of pride campaigns in every giant corporation on earth, um, it doesn't really affect the lives of like real people at all, right? So I wonder within the group of philosophy students who are, you know, maybe are supportive of you but uh, disagree, but disagree with your ideas, which one yeah. of their arguments do they put up? Do you find have the most uh, value in that, you know, the ones where you need to consider? Um, I guess a student recently who disagrees with me, with me but has been like also very supportive um, and very constructive, he's been pushing me quite a bit on certain spaces like, like bathrooms, I think. Um, and that actually comes up a bit in the new book. Like I thought, I'll do a detailed treatment of one space because so much of this discussion is messy, right? It's like as though the question's just trans inclusion, trans women's inclusion or not. But of course you can you can do that space by space and there's different reasons and arguments. So I think, yeah, he's been sort of pushing, pushing me a bit on, yeah, I guess it's like given the brevity of the use and given the unlikeliness of what anything in the safety category really happening um yeah and maybe just sort of asking questions around those kinds of issues or or asking questions about I guess in in one case it was like yeah who sort of has the right to comment on this that was also interesting like there is a sense in which like feminists are outsiders to these decisions of parents and their children about what's in the best interest of the child when it comes to transition 
Uh, so is that the kind of issue where it should just be up to each guardian's best judgment and it's kept in the family or is this really a social issue that we all have the right to weigh in on so yeah there's certainly interesting stuff where I think okay yeah like there's still more things to to talk about here um but I have to say and maybe this just sounds obnoxious but I yeah I still haven't really I don't think my commitment to gender critical or radical feminism has ever met any like serious (laughs) <laughs> I haven't yet found anything where I've been like oh shit like I really need to think that thing through that's a that's a really serious challenge like I I've mostly just kind of been for the last five years I think refining my position and 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 desperately hoping for the right kind of engagement from philosophical nemeses or whatever I should call them but but not quite getting it and I don't know whether that's because there just aren't that many great objections or whether it's because there's so much vitriol in this debate that we just never get to hear them and somehow they don't even trickle through. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which one of those is is more likely. I see. Um, I think the, the way I see it is that um, the, in the um, trans activist camp, they are interested, if if you boil down to every sort of like a, every, if you take out all of the nastiness that they are exhibiting, um, at the core of it, they are they are asking for civil rights or at yes. least uh, or the and also uh, equal recognition and um, dignity yes. but on the other hand um the gender critical feminist camp which you belong to is uh, diving into the the question of nature itself like uh what makes a woman a woman and what makes a man a man and and you know, therefore um say trans women cannot be considered uh women uh, but uh, I'd like you to explain your position on that, uh, where, whether we should be calling trans women women, why are they excluded from the women camp, so to speak. Yeah. Can I comment first on the civil civil rights and dignity Please comment? Yeah. Just because, yeah, I think it's I think it's I think it's a common sort of uh well, a common common belief that like um there's just like the dominant like the socially dominant and then trans people are the marginalized and they're asking the dominant to give them full civil rights uh and so then the question of trans inclusion looks really obvious like obviously the answer should be yes um and anyone who resists that is just like some sort of bigot or prejudiced or doesn't want is promotes social hierarchy or something like that um but i think that way of seeing things that like there's equality for everyone or basic rights for everyone and somehow trans people just don't have them but they need them I don't think that's the disagreement that's or I don't think that's a fair characterization of like what the gender critical person is denying because I think the gender critical person can agree anything that's for all humans any equal human dignity any basic human rights the trans person of either sex should have The disagreement for us is like, do the sex categories matter? And what's the relation between what they seem to be wanting to call self-determined gender, gender categories, maybe sometimes they say gender identity, but it always kind of gets rolled into gender. What's the relation between that thing and sex categories? And it's not at all obvious that you can't deny someone's membership in a sex category while still fully affirming and upholding their equal civic rights and their equal human moral equality I think the debate is just like exactly about how you do that um yeah so sorry that was just like a a sort of side point but I think the framing of that it's like important for us to resist it because because otherwise it looks like a sort of um a done deal like it's obvious what your position should be um now what did you ask me after that about the word woman was it Um Um, well, I, I think um, it would be good for you to provide a definition of what a woman is and why uh, trans women, as in males who transition into females, uh, do not fit that category. Yeah. So the, the, the gender critical feminist position is that women are adult human females. So the woman part of it is just modifying the age. <laughs> so there's nothing more or less to being a woman than being 
female and human, but we call the old ones women and the young ones girls. That's adult ones women and the young ones girl. Um, that's minimalist for a reason. I, I think the feminist thought is that that is like that's liberatory. So the second wave sort of p- feminist project was like there has been this construction of female people into like feminine beings that that's not natural to the female it's not that her innate biological disposition is to be pretty and servile and caring but rather like centuries maybe millennia of kind of cultural treatment and expectations and ideas have like constructed her that way and so their solution was to like stop stop like pushing female people into femininity they sort of I think also thought stop pushing male people into masculinity but they didn't make that their problem their problem was that the femininity being imposed or the socialization of female people um so yeah for us it's liberating to say a woman is nothing more and nothing less than a female there's no way she has to be there's nothing she could do short hair pants double mastectomy man's shirt hairy legs nothing there's nothing she could do that would make her not a woman so long as she's female but I just think you cannot hold that line which is yeah it it is the feminist line and it is liberatory for female people there's no way to hold that compatible with what the trans activists want which is that a certain amount of femininity whether in your gender expression or just in your like declaration about yourself and what you think your identity consists in makes you a woman (laughs) so so either either that's what it means to be a woman and then lots of female people aren't or it just means being a female and so I guess I'm just like putting planting my flag over in the nothing more and nothing less than a female category as is the whole sort of grassroots gender critical uh, movement and that hence the disagreement right because the trans activists want to say trans women are women there's absolutely no way for us to be able to countenance that we just have to say trans women are men so um so your definition reminds me of this uh, po- uh little <laughs> laptop sticker which uh i got when um kelly j keen was visiting vienna and um yeah yeah although i'm i'm a uh, generally a supporter of hers i i find her to be quite provocative at certain junctions like i i don't yeah. i'm not sure if she like recognized that trans people like uh, exist as a category so um I don't yeah. know if you know more about that, maybe you could comment more on you know, what your thoughts are on uh, uh, this woman. Uh, mm, yeah, no, I think that you might be right about that. I think I, I think she's even actually as some of the Let Women Speak rallies, I think she says there's no such thing as a trans child. There's no such thing as a non-binary person. There's no such. So, yeah, I think she is firmly on the side of like, this is a social construction and not even the one not way but I think a, a philosophical way to understand it is it's not even a successful social construction where now we've brought something into reality like money or whatever I think she just thinks there's a silly made-up thing that we keep referring to adult men in dresses are women or we believe in trans women let's all stop it like <laughs> I think that is her view and I think she's sort of on the side of the the feminists who think we should stop using that language altogether stop calling them women stop saying she stop doing any of that stuff like the emperor has no clothes on let's all just start saying it and let's go back to a kind of sex-based material reality and that would serve women's interests um and the thing is i'm not sure how much i disagree with her really sometimes i'm forced to use certain language like i just cannot publish my book with oxford university press and call trans women he like I'm just not allowed to and then I have to decide whether I'm willing to like lose my book contract with this academic press for the sake of this principle about pronouns yeah. I chose a certain way on that that I think other feminists won't like didn't like haven't liked um I just kind of made that trade off for me about the kind of the the metaphysical question are there really some trans people but they've just been exaggerated into this expansionist social contagion kind of hybrid strange modern category are there some but it's been exaggerated or are there really none 
I'm still like on the fence about that. I think at the moment, I think that empirical, at least the older empirical evidence on like transsexual males suggests there are some, like there are at least people that had such severe gender dysphoria and their distress can only be resolved by transition. I don't see why we shouldn't call that category trans women. Like, and then, okay, then, then there are some, they're really rare. There's a question about whether we should say they really are women or what kind of legal accommodations we should make for them. But I sort of, yeah, I sort of think there are, there are some trans people, just nowhere near as many as the, the zeitgeist wants to suggest there are and kind of offer up as an option for everyone's lives, like gender self-determination or whatever. But I might be wrong about that. It's an empirical question. Um, so I'm I'm open. I don't think Kelly J is actually an extremist, but I think her message is so like shocking compared to the message of the contemporary left that she's often seen as like this really militant extreme person. Yeah, I'm, I share your viewpoint. So um, uh, when I was um, still beginning my studies in philosophy, that was like in my teenage years, uh, and the works I turn to are from the existentialists, very cliche, you know, your Camus, mm -hmm. your Sartre, and your Nietzsche. And I suppose the if there is a central key message that all existentialists share is that you have to live with your own authentic being. And that kind, that being, that I guess that Dasein that Heidegger conceptualizes is yours to find out about. Like it's not up to God or other people to yeah. dictate how you're supposed to be. So, uh, of course, um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre is his longtime partner in, you know, in intellectuality and in you know, romance. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir says that one very famous line, one does not born but becomes a woman. So she applies that existentialism message to feminism. And I think that message carries uh, carries to uh, what the trans activism camp uh, wants. And that being that, well, if uh, I believe that uh, being a woman is my most authentic expression of being. And because of that, I'm willing to you yeah. know, to uh, present myself in a way that is closest to femininity or pass as one, as you would call it. And I would assume all of the duties and responsibilities uh, um, associated with womanhood. Well, I may not have been born a woman, but uh, I, I, I don't feel comfortable being a male. Uh, so that would be the typical position of someone yeah. who is like transitioning. So um, uh, what, what do you presuppose are the obstacles to uh, this given position? I guess the thing that I like the th the question that I have, and I tried to work this out with a colleague once, and I came away with the impression it just depends which existentialist you're reading. My question is, are there any constraints on that that sort of freedom, right? So because of course, like if there are none, if we really are just like we should be conceptualized as souls floating free in the abyss or immaterial thinking things that can just are what our possibilities are or what our what we want to be who's the we there if the if the i has any kind of meat container like if my body has anything to do with me the soul or the spirit or the thinking thing or wherever you want to sort of put the sense of self then I think that thing has some constraints. So I, I sort of, so long as it's possible to countenance the sort of existentialist idea, but with some constraints of embodiment, then I think you can deny that it's coherent as a thing to want for your, your, your possibilities to be the opposite sex. That's just not, you just are born and, the fact of being born to those parents at a time, it gives you a culture, a race, a height, probably an eye color, a sex. And that's your, that's your starting point. That's the thing who is free to decide anything and everything that its authentic self 
can be. But that's the thing. You're not free. You're not free to be a Sudanese woman. <laughs> you just aren't. So the Sudanese woman's existential possibilities, then they don't, they're not the same set of possibilities as you, even though, of course, you can both be a great poet or whatever. So I, I guess if you could just wheel in the kind of existentialist who just denies any material constraints, then you can make sense of that trans trans activists like the trans sort of way of telling the story and I think Talia May Betcher I mentioned this briefly in the book she does have a version of a story like that where she says her womanhood is existential and she compares it to being a teacher like a person who's never done any teaching ever but is an unactualized teacher <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and I find that really jarring too it's like really you you never took a teaching course you never read a book about teaching. You've never done any teaching at all, but just because you have some sort of sense of yourself and desire, you are in some sense a teacher. Like, I, yeah, for me, that's so unintuitive as well. So maybe that's also to say, like, I also just don't, I'm not super like on board with that, I, the whole framework in the first place. And I find that kind of hard to understand what what the use of it is supposed to be. I, I suppose um, there is a the what I would call the most significant break between ancient and modern philosophy is that uh, in the ancient world where how you were born decide how you're going to die so you remain the same essentially the same person that you are from birth till death but um yeah in the modern modern political philosophy thinking supposes that that need not be the case um, yeah. For example, there's a lot of things I can change about myself. Like I do not have to follow the same trade as my father, or I, mm, I do not have to um, live in the same country as my birth. And so I suppose um, existentialism is modernism, but on steroids or other performance yeah. enhancing drugs, so to speak. <laughs> so they would take that as saying that, well, I can change my race and or my um, uh, gender to uh, to be the most authentic version of myself. And of course, uh, you ha kind of have to counter it by referring back to ancient philosophy. And, and I think the question now remains, um, to what extent can you uh, modify yourself to, uh, to come close to this approximation of the most authentic being and what sort of constraints in life um, can you uh, do you have to live with? For example, I cannot, you know, I cannot fly without the assistance of like modern technology or something like that, right? No, I think that's exactly right. And I think maybe those questions we would be confronting are the same as we always confronted. Like maybe the person of humble origins who adopts the disguise and achieves social mobility way before his time like way before that's something that people in society can generally do maybe that guy is always thinking oh but I really am the son of a carpenter like even though I've achieved nobility or whatever did I really escape but I think we would feel those constraints now much more so I'm I'm transhumanist and I get google eyeballs or whatever put in but then it's like am I re am I really now part cyborg or am I actually just a human with a weird implant that's like pretending to be above my station or it is the man who gets sex reassignment surgery really a woman now or is he just like yeah a surgic like he's a male with a bizarrely modified body and he's he's pretending so when what is authenticity right it's like what yeah so I don't know maybe those questions are just the same as they ever were and maybe we just countenance more by way of change as time goes on. Um, maybe in another thousand years, everyone will accept change of sex by surgery and hormones and it'll be this next thing, the robot arm or whatever that everyone's worrying about, whether it's authentic. I'm really not sure, but I, for myself, philosophically, I do just have a really strong sense that certain things are hard constraints on our possibilities. And it doesn't. it's not even coherent to talk about whether I can become or I could have been male. It only makes sense to say I, the female New Zealander born to those parents in this kind of racial group, can I be a mathematician, a poet, an astronaut? Can I be kind? Can I be whatever? It's like 
you have to have the person first to ask what her possibilities are. And that just comes with some constraints. But maybe mm-hmm. I'm just being unimaginative. I don't know. <laughs> um, so Kathleen Stock in my interview with her suggested that uh, all this began with uh, Rene Descartes and you know his uh, focus on the cogito, the the mm-hmm. eye. And so um, you know, nature gets uh I guess uh subsume or subordinated in favor of the mind or the will. And I'm yeah. more or less inclined to uh you know uh, to take that position ever since we met. So uh, I think a another um, position that um, that I guess uh, people of the transgender activist camp may take is uh, what I call the postmodernist position. You know, if yeah. the existentialist may may well accept categories of things, but he or she admit, he or she believe that they are not fixed, so to speak. The postmodernists like uh, Michel Foucault and obviously Foucault's greatest acolyte in the gender identity um, sphere, Judith Butler, believes that all categories are oppressive in some ways because they limit you. And so they they believe in this wholesale abandonment of category because, again, they they represent some sort of power domination over something. And, And for that reason, well, Butler would suggest that we should abandon um, male and female as uh, as gender categories. Um, in that sense, transgender does not mean that you transition from one to the other. As the existentialist would suggest, it means you trans as in transcend beyond gender, mm-hmm. beyond male and female, to paraphrase Nietzsche. Um, you've suggested in an, uh, an essay in your book that being a woman carries with it some you know, potential harm, such as uh, being sexually harassed or assaulted or being subjected to misogyny and uh, all of that. And it has historically been the case. And in many cases, both in the Western world and in the non-Western world, that has also been the case as well. So what makes you w- want to hold on to this category of woman if you know that that entails all of these disadvantages? Oh, because <laughs> I mean, I guess the it's like what's Butler offering, right? Like, or what are the what are the post like? As if we just stop using the words and then the oppression goes away. Like, how great would that be? Uh, I wish there were no murderers. Let's stop using the word murderer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So I don't know. I just I really feel like so many of those academics are just like they're just fucking around. Like they're just. It's just sandcastles of ideas and that's it's not a practical solution or at least you never get told the story in words you can comprehend about what the strategy is supposed to be for actually dealing with current oppression and subordination and how that's supposed to be a strategy that will get social uptake and land us somewhere useful. I mean, it's not like the postmodernists are just against social categories, but they have a coherent political story about liberal individualism in the background right they're not for anything they'd stand for nothing they think there's nothing and then and then what well great thanks like (laughs) why should we listen to anything that you say I'm sure Kathleen probably said probably said similar things like she has a good um takedown of Butler I think in her book um yeah so but the straightforward answer separate of the postmodernists to why we should care about retaining the category when there's harm associated with it is that it's not the it's not the category that's the problem, right? So, female people have been picked like that. Th- that's a real type of person, and if it wasn't, it would have been quite hard to select her for systematic subordination. Um, she is a real type of person, and over the years, certain sorts of things have been associated with her, or projected onto her, or yeah, expected of her if you want her subordination and and oppression to end, you need to target those stereotypes and expectations and treatment. The the fact of her existence is not the problem. (laughs) The fact of what you believe about her, the person who exists. So, yeah, I think for us, I mean, I should be fair and say, like, what the the kind of blowing up the categories suggestion, there it does exist in second wave feminism pre-Butler, uh, in a sort of slightly more sensible way. So they were talking about whether we should like 
cut the legs out from under the possibility of sex discrimination by stopping tracking sex and just talking about humanity. And I, every year in my feminism course, I sort of talk about this, talk about this with the students. I don't remember every year if it's been as skeptical, but this year it was like, there's so little patience for sex abolitionism as a project. And I think partly because it's just so, yeah, we, as humans, we're so good at detecting it. And maybe there's a bit of lack of imagination in like, really, if we shaved everyone's head and we all did the same amount of exercise and we all wore the same ugly sack, would we definitely know who's female and who's male? I reckon we would be more confused, but I think we'd probably still know 40% of the the each case and then maybe there's 10% on either side where it's a bit more, we, we, there's more androgyny and more confusion. But I actually just don't think it's practical and my students seem to have that sense too, that you can actually really ever deconstruct or abolish sex category um just like you couldn't really stop ever like seeing with your eyeballs the difference between like black skin and white skin like you're still gonna see it the question is what sorts of social meanings or expectations you apply on its basis so again i just think the gender critical feminist project is don't pretend you can't see that stuff work on what people think it means and what follows from it that's the the truly kind of liberatory thing and notice that we do that in other areas too we don't say oh there's just pansexuality and nothing else and pretend that homosexuality and heterosexuality don't exist rather we say some people are gay get over it right so it's like you you can have difference without having social hierarchy i think so what's this weird project of when it comes to sex assuming that there just cannot be difference or else there will be social hierarchy we should at least be having the argument about why in some cases we can accommodate and normalize difference. And in this case, where it's just assumed that we can't. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think going back to the um, existentialist uh, discussion that we had earlier, I think one, one argument that you can counter um, the trans activist uh, line uh, that's based on the same like existentialist framework is that, well, uh, you mentioned that uh, a lot of uh, people who experience um, gender dysphoria or gender confusion in their early years are most often going to um, end up uh, being uh, same sex attracted. And, yeah. um, and, you know, and we can use that uh, fact to say that, well, transitioning is actually um, counter to your in uh, your authentic being because why don't you just accept the fact that you are a same sex attracted person rather than just going out of your way to transition into another sex into in order to make yourself feel normal and um, that that is the same argument that um, one of my guests uh, the writer Ben Appel who recently wrote an article on Spike and he. He's going to have a book out called cis white gay he says that yeah they, uh, yeah being um being gay it's okay and you don't have to transition in order to be quote unquote straight and it, and yeah. he, he mentioned this surprising fact that the government of the islamic republic of iran which is not friendly to gay people is actually very friendly to trans people trans, yeah yeah um, yes. No, I mean, I'm familiar with the, the argument. I suppose the only thing that gives me pause on that is that I, I'm, I f this is me like choosing whether to be a philosopher or a politics, uh, to do politics or to do philosophy. So I'm, I'm just, we're philosophers, right? So I'm choosing the philosophical <laughs> in this point, but I think people, people that want me to hold a political line will be annoyed about it. Um, there are many lesbians transitioning today and they seem happy. So the fact that they can like just kind of um, get top surgery and then live as men or be in these trans friendly sub communities from the testimony I've heard from people who, who kind of know lots of these people or who talk about it in podcasts and so on, they're having a great time. They're getting laid lots. They're making lots of, like getting exciting new relationships and being in fun communities and having lots of like so great social lives and um 
maybe they were sort of tomboys or kind of butch gender non-conforming anyway so this feels more comfortable therefore they feel more comfortable being like normal men than being like exceptional or unusual women I feel like such a traitor politically saying this but I think the philosopher in me just wants to say shit like if there really are two pathways that a same-sex attracted female can take and she'll flourish in both of them then I'm not sure how strong the reasons are that you can like of course the lesbians can say well it's cultural loss like we're losing people to this new fad of course we can weigh up the harm so top surgery is invasive and painful those people might want to breastfeed later on and then they've lost the chance to do that we shouldn't be like having unnecessarily like unnecessary body interventions so you can say all that stuff but then I yeah I sort of think well there's two cultural constructions of this same-sex attracted gender non-conforming girl and if she is happy in both yeah that kind of argument you describe and that people on my side often describe like stop transing away all the gays it does start to lose a bit of it's not obvious at least that like we can just call that a call that a loss because they're still gay in a sense they're just they're still sleeping with the same people they're just kind of calling themselves men and I yeah I don't know maybe we just have to weigh up all the harms and benefits on either side of that and I think if we did that it would still come out that like the unmodified body the acceptance of oneself and one's sexual orientation the political importance of being a, a dissident like being different and celebrating that and accepting it rather than taking on the costs to be normal and invisible that's political right like we want some people to be brave because that makes things better for everyone else so maybe it still is better overall if they would accept being gay rather than claiming to be trans but maybe the trans activists would say well it's still really politically useful if they claim to be tra trans <laughs> it's just a different way of being different so yeah I'm, I'm still trying to work out how all that stuff shakes out but I think it's maybe since I started working on yeah sexual orientation and gender identity stuff a bit more like trying to compare and contrast them and work out the some questions around their similarity and difference I have ended up being a bit confounded by this thought that like a lot of lesbians are transitioning and they seem happy so shit like <laughs> yeah what do you think what yeah what um well um it's I, yeah, it's um, it's very reductive just to say, well, do whatever makes you happy, right? But well, I am I always believe that well, we should not transition children, and you know, you wait till you're eighteen to make your final decision, and then once you do, you kind of have to live with it. So, uh, whatever yeah. decision that they decide to make, or whether to remain a cis female lesbian, so the boring type, or a uh, interesting male trans person who's <laughs> yeah. attracted to women and be quote unquote straight uh yeah they have to you know really consider that and of course once they've made that choice they kind of have to live it for live with it for the rest of their days Which, yeah but do you think it's wrong yeah. like do you think someone like the guy you described if you tell him like these people have made that choice and they're happy and their lives maybe are actually going more interestingly and better because of the social fad around this than they would be if they were like just lesbians. Do, yeah. Do you think, are you happy with saying that? And do you think he would be happy with saying that? Or we just always want to push back and find reasons why like that's not the choice they should have made. And we, we should keep trying to say that out loud so that more adults don't make that choice. And we keep people in the gay team and stop. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question, and I I think um, I think people who are gay would uh, have more of a, have a more coherent answer than I am because um, apparently it's a it's an internecine fight between uh, the gays and the trans at this point. So uh, yes. I would more or less defer to them. So uh, I, any answer that I come up with might be inadequate. But uh, I I would like to bring up the topic of well, uh, was that book by Abigail Schreier, right? Uh, Irre Irreversible mm -hmm. damage. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. she is um, she's uh pointing to a cultural phenomenon where young girls are feeling uncomfortable with being female, and so 
they look to transition into males. And so far, I think that's the only notable work I find that tackles the problem of um, female to male trans, uh, transitioning. Uh, for the most part, the discourse that I hear regards to male to female transitioning, whether it is in regards to sports or uh, in the example of Scotland prisons. Yes. And I think if we were to apply, say, uh, cultural critical theory into this uh, discussion, uh, as if we've we've uh, exhausted all the philosophical schools at this point. Um, <clears throat> I I believe that um, Western culture. I'm not I'm not very much familiar with the culture of other non-Western spheres. Um, uh, there are certain certain like traits, uh, quirks, or stereotypes associated be with being males and females and and of course, it comes with the fact that there are a good amount of expectations being uh, carried by people of different genders. Um, you're expected to be this way if you're male, and you're expected to be this way if you're female. And I suppose the brunt of these of these uh, cultural influences, as well as expectations, they are harder than on like, young girls rather than young boys, and. And I think that's where the most compelling argument that uh, the gender critical feminist camp is making is that there are very diverse, there's a diverse array of being male and being female without losing the authenticity of, of masculinity or femininity. And I think, uh, you know, uh, if uh, I were a gender critical feminist, I would push that one at the forefront. Um, so how do you suppose um, our culture can reflect this uh, diversity of maleness and femaleness? I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. So I take the point about the like certain societies have more traditionalist like divisions of labor. So it's going yeah. to be different between different countries, what it like means to be a woman or a man or like what the girl and the boy are like looking forward or like seeing that is going to be expected of them um but what's the what's the question in relation to that fact like um is there any way that um uh we can uh i guess uh proclaim that message that there are more than one way to be a man or one more than one way to be a woman so people who do not see that, uh, who sees that transitioning is the only choice, do not have to do so. No. Yeah, how can we tell that message? I mean, gosh, I, th I mean, I think this is just like, this is the, this is the debate between the gender critical feminist and the trans activist right now, because the, the second wave feminists, which is sort of our foremothers, they were just saying like, let kids be kids. And stop imposing these gender norms on kids on the basis of their sex let's just everyone is human like everyone's got these interesting possibilities let's stop locking them into boxes so I think that's so much of what we're trying to say is like that message is so much more liberating gives children so much more room for self-expression and self-discovery and freedom then this idea that there are two types of person, but it's just really important for the small number of trans people that they get to choose which type of person they are. Like it's when you really put it in that way, like it just looks so extraordinarily under ambitious. It's like a kid now that doesn't want to grow up to do all the housework in a more conservative place. Her option is to become a boy. Like, and that's the, the progressive thing that you're going to push for rather than like, girls shouldn't have to do a disproportionate share of domestic labor yeah so I, I I I mean I suppose that if I'm being charitable the the sophisticated trans activist would try to say you can do both at once right you can you can sort of push that like people can be whatever they like and women don't have to do that kind of labor and also people can change sex slash gender whatever that means but I think as we talked about earlier, I do just think those messages are really fundamentally in conflict. How can you say there's nothing more or less to being a man than being a male, nothing more or less to being a woman than being female. Anyone, regardless of sex, can do anything. But also, if you're a bit feminine, 
you're a woman, if you're a masculine, you're a man, and it's really important to get to choose which very different type of human you are because gender categories matter so much and they're so important for people's self-determination, gender, gender, gender. Like, yeah, I just think those are two completely different messages. So I almost get the sense that like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too by saying both. But what they really care about is what they're saying about trans people and about gender freedom and self-determination. And that actually is a conservative, under-ambitious message relative to what the, the feminists are trying to say, which is let everyone be free. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is the um that is the central dilemma that faces uh the postmodernist, the Judith Butler type, right? You want to abolish all of the categories in order to feel uh free or liberated. But then you end up being very confused, and therefore you you kind of real need to rely on these categories in order to provide a more coherent definition of who you are. Mm. Well, I think that's almost I would think of that as a separate point, almost like to the person, not even the postmodernist, right, but the person that thinks we should be fully free, like there's just human individuals, and they should be able to choose whatever they want to be like. I think a more conservative, not in the, just in the sort of coll colloquial sense, a more conservative person would say, well, I actually need some structure, right? Like what is freedom with no, you know, like a child, like, uh, it's maybe the wrong way to tell it, but like if you sit down with a child and felt pens and you just say draw anything, they often just don't know how to start. So it's like it's actually better if you say like, shall we draw a flower should we draw a house should we draw a dog or oh, maybe we could fold our paper in half and do that thing where we will draw half of each other's like you need to put some scaffolding out for people to even start knowing what freedom might look like like what other possibilities um so i can make sense of it in that sense like well no we don't just want like absolute freedom we do want some templates but then that almost starts to look like that's an objection to the gender critical project of gender abolitionism and it's trying to creep back in towards the sort of more conservative line of like no let's just like revise it in various ways because people need people need gender templates people need ideas for do they want to chop the firewood or do they want to cry like um mm -hmm. yeah i think i'm a bit i just am more hopeful about human like we are imaginative i'm sure we can make up some new templates that don't like tie they're not just two boxes um maybe we can make 10 templates and then lots of people could just not want any of them but the but the less imaginative people could pick one of them i don't know i'm sure there's a way to solve that problem yeah yeah so i think there is a good reason why the classical liberal conception of freedom entails the rule of law which limits the kind of behavior that either the state or the individual cannot do so yeah i'm, I'm of the conception that freedom must have limits, limits. or else we are yeah, just wandering, confused uh, souls. So, um, yeah. final question to close this off. Um, who are some of the thinkers, uh, feminists or otherwise, that uh, you find to be most influential on your own thinking? I was actually talking to my my co-author Kate Thielen, um, who is like my favorite alive uh, philosopher. <laughs> we were trying to talk about this last night, um, because. And, and I think coming to the conclusion that a lot of our favorite people are dead, which is quite sad because we're like, it would be so great to be able to travel and go somewhere and meet your heroes, right? Or like spend some time talking to those people that you really admire. But yeah, I think so much of my intellectual focus at the moment has been on like, yeah, early in the second wave and the, the rad femmes who really managed to like break away from the left, like the clutches of the leftist men always telling them that like the Vietnam war is more important than their interests. And then they started doing real feminism. Like I like, I'm obsessed. Like Andrea Dworkin's writing is so amazing and powerful and yeah, there's just so much cool stuff there, but they are almost all dead now. <laughs> It's a bit sad. So, yeah, there was no chance to like meet together at a conference and have like the best conversation ever. So I think we're both, Kate and I, in search of new alive heroes, but we're both feeling like a little bit dispirited with our discipline at the moment that like there are obviously some some kind of brave people in it, but on our topic, they're a little few and far between. And I guess Kathleen's a kind of hero of mine, but she has now been pushed out. So mm -hmm. um 
that's kind of sad. Like, yeah, I would say I'm a bit in need of a new alive philosophical hero, but I'll I'll keep my optimism open for for finding one. <laughs> so yeah, um, I would say a mixture of uh, um, dead or and alive uh, thinkers uh, influence my own thinking as well. And the um, the advantage of uh, having this podcast is I get to meet some of the living ones. So um, yeah, of course, uh, yourself aren't it's included. So um, thank you very much again, Holly Lawford Smith, author of Sex Matters, for joining the show. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. <laughs>